Uh, I, I'd have a, a comment dash co a question to, uh, 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 to the th uh, three of you. F uh, first, uh, uh, on Sylvia, uh, if I take the oil prices, uh, in one decade we uh, traveled between $17 uh, to 100 uh, uh, back to 140, 100, I mean, uh, there's no market here. Uh, there are, uh, there's a system. Uh, in fact, it's not only oil, of course, it's uh, all the commodities. I mean, uh, uh, just after the start of the financial crisis, we had all these people migrating from uh, rotten papers to, uh, to grain, Chicago Board of Trade and so forth, price of corn doubled. We had 150 million more people going hungry. Uh, I mean, uh, it would be very interesting how you see uh, the, the problem. It is a key issue, I think, worldwide. Imagine so many African countries where I've worked where uh, uh, getting access to oil is vital, and you, you don't know how much you'll pay next year or the next. You don't, may, you don't have any plan. I mean, uh, are there in this governance issue, any initiatives uh, in uh, price stabilization and, and, uh, and, and things of the, of the kind. Um, I mean, you, you have all these uh, derivatives problems. I mean, uh, the, the derivatives now at uh, uh, outstanding derivatives are roughly $600 trillion for a, a world GDP of $70 uh, trillion. There's no, I, th I think it's a key issue. I'd like you, so, some comments. Uh, uh, I'd like to comment uh, 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 on uh, 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 Mark's uh, uh, discussion on this. I, I thought it very interesting. I mean, you, you have to put the stakeholders together. Uh, uh, I remember the, the pro alcohol issue in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, it is interesting because it was a change of technology that over a couple of years completely changed the whole energetic basis uh, of the car system in, uh, in Brazil. And the idea was that you linked the uh, stake, key stakeholders that together made enough power to shift uh, the thing. Uh, particularly the big landowners who produced sugar cane uh, does that and, and, and so forth. So, uh, 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 how do you see this? Uh, because this is in, in, in terms of governance of change uh, or governing change. I mean, this is a, a, a key issue. Yes, uh, I, I would like to uh, to comment to uh, to Jörg. Um, uh, uh, I don't know if it was conscious, but uh, you you wrote into second play that. Uh, uh, management of uh, mountain areas is full of ups and downs. Uh, <laughs> I would have thought so. <laughs> but let me, on the serious area, let me comment that uh, uh, we're working on a huge national program in Brazil uh, for local empowerment of the development policies we need people to participate. So instead of going to the formal legal divisions, we went to what people felt as an identity. They belong to a valley, they belong to a, a, to a, 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 to a river, they be, or think of the kind. And they, I, I think the parallel is very interesting because we, we found it extremely productive. This is working now in roughly 1,200 municipalities in Brazil. I think it's a little of the, the same approach. Which actually, it's not only territory-based approach; it's a people-based, uh, community-based approach. Thank you. Should we answer this? Répondez, ouais. Je pense tous les trois, vous pouvez. Okay. <laughs> Choisissez l'ordre à vous-même. <laughs> oh, excuse me. I speak English, French. You can, uh, you can respond, and you choose the order by yourself. I think it's better. <laughs> I'll start the order that you raised the question. 
Um, first of all, I'm not an economist, so I, I will not give a very insightful uh, answer to your question. But what I've understood from others who are looking at uh, the oil markets, they do claim that there is one integrated oil market, and that is all even emerging one um, global integrated market on, on gas, because of the new technology that you can actually transport gas. And I guess it operates as a market, I mean, with the nervousness of, of a market, uh, and um, that economists can describe better than uh, I can, but it is clear that there is no global regulation of, of uh, and there's certainly, as far as I know, <coughs> no efforts to, to, to um, uh, regulate the oil prices. I mean, they, they, that there has been a lot of push, I think, from, from at least non-OPEC countries to try and get away from government influence on the oil prices because of the challenges with that before. They want a, a, a completely market-driven um, fossil fuel market. And there's also no global carbon price, for example. But uh, it's, I, I don't know how much uh, a stable climate regime with a, a, a very, you know, stable regulatory framework for how the carbon <coughs> regulation would look at in the next 20 years, if that would have an influence, stabilizing influence on oil market, that also I would leave to economists. But I, uh, maybe one reflection is that when I followed the negotiations in the UN on sustainable energy in exactly one of these years when, when the oil price was over $100, all of a sudden, uh, so many countries, so many developing countries were crying for support for them to get renewable energy. And I think uh, that indicates that a, a sustainable global energy system needs to have a much, much, much larger share of renewable energy to overcome this crazy uh, changes in, in oil prices. These countries um, started to realize um, that this would be uh, beneficial to them. Okay, thank you for your uh, question. I indeed, um, transition to ethanol is a very interesting one in Brazil. I have not uh, studied it greatly, so I don't know the details. Uh, I can imagine that it went relatively smooth uh, because it, it, was, it was a new opportunity for many uh, stakeholders in Brazil, the landowners uh, with a new market. And I can imagine that, there were, that the losers may have been foreign companies or not. Um, the oil companies uh, was probably important, yeah. That helps uh, a lot. Uh, but I would also be interested to see whether it was sort of government uh, initiated or whether, what it, uh, whether it was more a bottom-up process. I would have to look at it uh, better. But obviously, the, 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 the more there are vested interest, uh, interests in the country itself, uh, the more difficult uh, these more transitional processes are because the losers are at the table, so to speak. Um, so that's also why um, some authors think that uh, countries without an automotive industry have most potential for electric vehicles, for example. Yeah. So, but... Um, well, it's a nice example of a transition, indeed, a very, very fundamental change, although it is a change in the fuel system, basically, uh, less in the, in the engine technology that, uh, yeah, it, it was a relatively, uh, technically speaking, a minor adaptation of the engines to make them suitable for uh, ethanol, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks for the comments. <laughs> um, the ups and downs referred primarily to the graph of the development uh, of, of um, regional and non-regional environmental agreements with the ups in the 70s and the 90s and then the downs in between. But having said that, I did my, uh, my thesis on, on mountain policies in, in, uh, in California and in Switzerland, and the title of the book is uh, Uphill Struggle. So that is an indication as well of, 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 of it. Um, very glad to hear the initiative in, in Brazil. Um, I certainly think it, it, it makes it easier to not only to, to, to mobilize uh, people but also to have meaningful participation when it can be organized around an identity. But of course, as we know, it's or often the, the, the organization of the state that makes it difficult. Um, so it probably varies by 
purpose of such an organization, such a mobilization, uh, whether it can be successful or not. As soon as you have, um, say, financial resources that have to be channeled through the state, then pre-existing state structures often make it difficult to uh, to do that. Uh, and that's very much a very much a, an issue in in, in mountain uh, agreements as well, because the mountains often cut through administrative boundaries. And um, the Alpine Convention is organized at the level of municipalities, but as a, as a legal instrument, it doesn't have any funding to speak of to implement projects. When it comes to implementing projects, then it's the EU Territorial Cooperation Program, Alpine Space, for which the delimiter, uh, the, the, the perimeter is defined on the basis of the, of the subnational regions like Bavaria and, and so on. Uh, and then you obviously move beyond the, the sort of natural boundaries of the mountain. Okay, sorry. This is okay. I'm done with it. Some other question? Uh, I see. Uh, we, we're coming to the end of the two days and we've been very much on the global position. Uh, I, I'd like to ask uh, Sylvia on the regional experience in Europe. Uh, <laughs> I see you uh, take a grimace, I don't know what you say. Yes, I mean, here you have therefore national interest, because you've pointed that out. And so is that experience valid for, uh, so we say, the global uh, perspective, when you take into account all these pipelines and Gerhard Schroeder being uh, first a chancellor and then an energy expert. Uh, my, my question, yes, uh, I'm not gonna ask anything to um, Mark because uh, I feel his ex uh, paper is absolutely a wonderful complement to the first paper of uh, Carlo Rubia. Okay. You know, so, yeah. well. But my, my question to Jörg is, uh, mountains are often separations between states. And so for me, one key word in your title is transboundary regions. And you didn't really explain political problems. Very nice for Europeans to work together and North Americans. Okay, you have Latin America, but the big, wonderful mountain area in the world is the Himalayas. So, you know, what do you do with political problems? You, you Thank you. <laughs> Two questions at the same time? Well, uh. I think following on from the beginning of the discussion, I think two issues. One on the issues of uh, markets and prices. I think we have an excellent example here of conflicts between the need for governance in different areas. Because while, for my say, for sustainability or long-term investment, you want some kind of price stabilization, some kind of you know, prices you can invest, expecting to get certain returns on. On the other hand, the financial system benefits from being able to speculate on you know, buying and selling short to make money from the instability in prices. So that part of the system you know, benefits from the uncertainty and it sort of exploits and uh, destabilizes sustainability in the world for its own immediate benefit in terms of the ability to speculate. They go micro trading so that the, the big banks can make their money off the, the poor, you know, sl slow normal traders who can't compete with them in technology. So I think it's an excellent example of how the, the system is out of control in some ways and it's, it's not being driven by values for sustainability but other kinds of values of immediate profit that make, make governance very difficult. And so we need to say, how do we achieve levels of governance across all these different parts of the system in some way that can become more coherent? And it may, may mean having to say, deal with finance system governance may be an essential requirement to achieve sustainability governance in other areas. 
these are all inter interrelated in some complex ways. I think also a question that may, you may all want to, to exp think about, maybe everybody else as well, what are the optimal sizes and amounts of governance at different scales? You can have too much or too little. Uh, it may be there's an advantage, rather than having very strong elements of governance doing many things, that you want to have several light layers controlling different parts of a process at different geographic scales, but working with some kind of, of constructive complementarity where certain things, you, you look at water governance by, by watersheds, whereas mountain governance is looking at, at a different scale, and then governance of transport and people at a different scale. You wouldn't want to do it all with the same structure in the same place, but you need some kind of coherence among different levels of governance. And part of that achieving sustainability may be saying, what, are the, what, is, what is the optimum between too much and too little governance? And how do we research and explore some of those issues so that we can help provide guidance for the future with respect to what systems are going to work best as we are dealing with very complex systems with no single solutions, but some combination of solutions? Thank you. I think you can respond. It's a long question. <laughs> do you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, is this working? Can you hear this? OK. Should I use this? Is this better? Okay. So yes, mountains are often a separation between states. Um, and But the trans, the trans boundary um, dimension can be divided, I would say, into things that are shared and things that are common. Um, so shared things in mountain regions are certainly water courses, um, biodiversity habitats, because they often go over the, the ridge, um, certain markets, and certainly transport. Uh, mountains are not just um, areas of separation, but also areas of linkage. Um, maybe not over the Mount Everest, but... Um, so as far as the Himalayas are concerned, um, I'm not a specialist, um, but from what I know is that perhaps there the issues are more um, common rather than shared, and common in the sense that they are similar experience stemming from the fact of being in the mountains, that is, having to deal with the impact of climate change, having to deal with um, the specific challenges to agriculture and forestry um, from elevation and, and, and slope. Um, so it's, it's, it's true in a sense that there are separations, but they're also linkages. Um, um, to the comment by, by Arthur, I can only agree. I think it's, it's a question of complementarity, not of, of uh, mutual exclusiveness. And so in a sense, what is needed is some procedural, uh, procedural principles for deciding what should be decided where. And some people uh, at this workshop have talked about subsidiarity. Uh, which in some ways can be considered that. Um, but uh, I think the devil's probably in the details. So it's not just that we need procedural principles for deciding what levels of governance at which levels, but also principles for deciding who should decide what should be the criteria. So it always moves up until you're talking about meta-governance and uh, it's a vicious cycle. Okay, um, no, while I was making a bit of a sigh when you asked about the EU governance, it's because I really not an, um, haven't looked at energy governance in the EU in particular. So um, while I actually have a background in multi-level governance, that is kind of a hole now when I'm, uh, I've been looking at global e energy governance. But maybe I can give a couple of examples. I mean, on the one hand, EU is now um, uh, putting a... Uh, yeah becoming very much uh, um, involved also internally and, and bringing up energy um, to, to be at the level of EU governance, which it hasn't had, it wasn't uh, a competence before. And how much that links to the process that the EU is very, very strongly promoting stronger governance in the UN on energy, on sustainable energy. It was really the, the maybe the, the key uh, uh, driver for 
trying to get the UN system to, to have this issue on the agenda. It was the key driver for getting this goal for global energy, um, increasing the proportion of, global, um, of renewable energy in the global energy mix in the Johannesburg summit. It was EU who got it there, you know, by tough negotiation tactics and I don't know what threats or whatever they managed to. So, so if that links to their experiences um, at the regional level in governance or whether it links to, to their um, perspective on climate changes, I, yeah, I, I cannot give detailed empirical answers to that. But I'm thinking about another regional context and that is the UNECE region. I mean, there uh, at least there are some technical committees uh, at that regional level that have for a long time have uh, developed for uh, technical standards around uh, issues that relate to energy, which is a rather hidden form of governance, but still very influential. Um, moving on to Arthur's um, challenging comment, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I th I, my comment would be that absolutely there's always complementarity. I would uh, always see that there's need for governance at each level. And the question is indeed, how do you identify how much at, at what level? And that's what, why I, um, to, to, to kind of uh, make that a bit more systematic and, and following some kind of principle, that's why I was looking at uh, the EU experience in that with subsidiarity and translating that to the global level. Um, one aspect of that is then, of course, that it may very much vary over time how much governance is needed on a particular level. Because the subsidiarity principle there, for example, said, well, you need governance at a higher level if there is lack of political will at a lower level or if there's lack of capacity. And of course, we can imagine maybe in 20 years there's enormous political will for renewable energy at the national level. Who knows? Or the capacity has been built. I mean, so, so this is certainly something that will be very dynamic over time and very issue specific. Yeah, re regarding the layers, I would, um, in, in, in my understanding, both um, energy and transport are, are examples that uh, indeed would, uh, would, would will only be successful, I think, when, when having uh, governance, uh, uh, different governance layers. Because at, at the local level, it's really clear that, uh, that it is a, a large <coughs> component of, of the way people use energy and the way people use their cars. and despite how, how good it is that on the global level these energy discussions take place. Um, in, in Maastricht we see people only getting engaged in this, uh, both in their thinking and in their doing, as soon as they're sort of part of a, a group or a discussion, starting to think about either energy efficiency measures or solar panels on their roofs. And I think they, these things can or should go very much hand in hand with the national government discussing with the big electricity companies and on a global level thinking about relations between countries and, and, and continents. Um, yeah, regarding car use, I think it's the same thing. It has to do with why you use your car, whether you use it in an urban area or not. It has to do with parking policies of, of, of cities, uh, but um, emission requirements are a European uh, discussion. On a na national level, there's the, the, the discussion of subsidies or not. So these, uh, indeed, I think, should very much uh, go hand in hand uh, with each other. Um, yeah, and then these days with the communication possibilities, that also shouldn't be a problem, I think. Um, I, I totally agree that I think my, um, my paper uh, complements uh, uh, with, with uh, Carlos Rubia's story. Um, I felt very much a, a, a technical fix uh, in his conclusion. Um, and uh, the point is, certainly we need these great minds and engineers and technicians thinking about technical solutions. But typically, most of sustainability issues are uh, social issues. So there's a strong component in the difference of interest, different in perspectives of actors. So these things uh, should somewhere go hand in hand and come together. And I think some way uh, of, 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 of platform or whatever how you call it, uh, needs to be uh, uh, become a vehicle of, uh, of getting both the difference in the perspectives explicit, because uh, in Maastricht we've seen that they've been talking about uh, energy decrease uh, for about six years, and there were a lot of technical plans, probably by great minds, made about the technical possibilities, but nothing really changed, nothing really happened. 
And typically that is the case when everybody has its own stake and interest and people don't talk about that with each other. So I think that a more reflection on each other's positions and um, uh, yeah, interest is necessary in order to move forward without, I think my, if I gave the impression that the dialogue was uh, a way of getting an agreement uh, about what sustainability is, that was not the case. I think it can be that there are different definitions of sustainability that are all legitimate, but at least by making that explicit in a dialogue with each other, there can still be progress on um, steps towards uh, a more, more sustainable um, either transport or energy system. Um, so that is... Um, yeah, that was basically my point.